Welcome to Amsterdam and KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2023. Join John Furrier, Savannah Peterson, Rob Streche, and Yu Pizka as the Cube covers the largest conference on Kubernetes, cloud native, and open source technologies together with developers, engineers, and IT leaders from around the globe. Live coverage of KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2023 is made possible by the support of Red Hat, the CNCF, and its ecosystem partners. Good evening and welcome back to KubeCon Europe. We are live from Amsterdam. My name is Savannah Peterson and I am sandwiched by brilliant men right now. I feel very good about this. I've got Rob on my left, I've got Yup on my right, and I've got one of our favorite CUBE alumni, Bassam, over here. Bassam, welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me again. I mean, you're obviously great. That's why we've had you back, what, seven times? Thank you. Yes, I appreciate it. Every one of them. So. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. Is that okay you say that? <laughs> what do you think of the show so far? It's great. It's uh, really awesome to see the energy. It's the largest European open source conference, which is just awesome to see. That is cool, isn't it? it yeah. And like half the people are new. So it's like, you know, every, every year you come back to KubeCon and you think, Wait, it's the same people, but it's not. It's actually new people, which is you know exciting. This this community continues to grow. And well, and at such scale. I mean, you mentioned earlier they said what fifty eight percent. Fifty eight percent were, were yeah. first time attendees. It's exciting. You know, I think we're still at a real momentum build up stage with all yeah, of this. This cloud native thing is actually uh, picking up. You think? You think we're going to stay? You know? So, yeah. 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 <laughs> Might be real. Cloud might be real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cloud might be real. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I thought what was also interesting was they talked about over fifty-four thousand, you know, community members out there. So if you look at it that way, and you've got, you know, ten thousand of them here right. today, where how many of those? I, it would be interesting oh, to know to how much it over, yeah. overlapped. Uh, is it people coming here first and then getting involved in the community or not? That 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 would be interesting to understand. But yeah, I wonder how much of this is a gateway drug. Or yes. is more, uh, you know, or is established. Well, actually, yeah. no, we had Red Hat on just a second ago, and they were commenting on how the experts are here helping out the kind of first True. timers or, or folks getting started. And I do, I will say, manage a lot of communities. Open source community is one of the best at that. It, it, is, it, yeah. it really is inclusive. They make you feel welcome. I'm a non-technical, and even I feel welcome, which really says something. <laughs> Which is a real accomplishment. Anyone who makes me feel welcome, that's a real accomplishment, quite frankly. Hassan, what are some of the trends you've noticed? I mean, look, uh, I think the thing that stands out to me is that I think about five years ago, this was all about Kubernetes, right? And I mean, it is KubeCon. It is KubeCon. It's also yeah. Cloud Native Con. It right? is. So, uh, both. It's, it's Don't both. forget both hashtags exactly. on everything. Um, so, in some ways, I think the you know, if you were to look back five years ago, this is all about containers and microservices and all that stuff. And now we're actually seeing it branch out, right? We're seeing a very clear totally branch out, right? Now yeah. it's like Cube, Kubernetes managing everything, right? Like it's literally becoming yeah. the way uh, that everyone's doing automation or infrastructure and everything else. And it looks like it's completely branching out, right? And not, you can see it from the vendors, you can see it from the open source projects, but you're getting into policy and cost and everything else starting to build around this ecosystem and it's just visible in every way. I think that's, I, yeah, I heard Kubernetes native as a term today for the first time and I yeah. think, we, I, I love that you just said that. It's so, it, when I, or, well, when most people I think were exposed to Kubernetes, it was all about containers. And now I feel like this whole conversation has yeah. expanded. Right, it's almost like containers are the, I, we, yeah. we honestly haven't even really talked about them that much. Uh, do do you know containers it, much? It, it's yeah. almost <laughs> taking a back seat. It's almost it taking really a back is. seat to the whole ecosystem maturing beyond just looking at compute, beyond right. just looking at scheduling. It's so much more. You know, there's vendors out here that do cost management, which wasn't a thing, um, right. or not not in any meaningful sense for the longest time because it's a great point. We had to innovate. We had to move forward, and now we're getting in, into the stage where maturity is actually. You know, becoming a differentiator, it's not just about getting into containers, it's actually being successful in production at scale with containers, and not just containers, okay. right? And I, I think that level of maturity is just fun to see because it's now no longer just that one single thing, it's a whole ecosystem, and it's grown way beyond Kubernetes. And I think that's, you know, that's, a, that's one of my key takeaways for yeah. this event and for today, is seeing that it's no longer just Kubernetes. I think that's a really, yeah, such a good point. And it's no longer just containers. There's there's so many different businesses. There's all this stuff going on. Speaking of conversations that have uh, heated up and matured, AI, chat, GPT, all the whisper, all the buzz around here. Bassam, what's your hot take? 
<laughs> uh, very interesting topic and uh, a trending topic, of course. But um, I don't know. It's interesting. I think we're we're barely scratching the surface on how AI intersects this cloud native uh, world, right? Totally uh, agree with you. Like the fingernail just, of the iceberg. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I think there's a lot of people here are trying to really quickly differentiate with with. Uh, Integrations, uh, chat, GPT. We're doing this. And, it's like, yeah. And everything has AI acronyms on it, right? It I went mean, from IO to AI real quick. I, there. I'm yeah. just imagining the people that are like literally changing booth design last minute to <laughs> add the word AI or put uh, a little chat GPT. Exactly. No, right? I totally. I think you're actually um, spot on with that. Yeah. Yet, it's not clear exactly how it's going to intersect, and so I think we have a lot to learn uh, in terms of you know what's actually differentiated, what actually has value, mm -hmm. what's actually going to work, what's not, right? And there's probably a lot also of legal and other implications of uh, of all this AI and ChatGPT stuff. So, so I think early days. It's super early days. Very early yeah. days. Yeah. I yeah. think it's changed. Like last year was like all about AI ops, and like everybody, like you're, you're saying, was like AIifying. You know, from an operations perspective, it was more about automation. And this and, year, yeah. you, you spin around, and it's not. It, it, you know, there's a few booths that have ChatGTP spelled out right on them, yeah, yeah. but it's like. Okay. Well, what about AI ops and ML ops? And I think to your point, you know, it was the the fact that it's those day two, day one, day two things that we're focusing on. Again, it's not about the containers and the infrastructure as yeah. much as it is about hey, we got day zero done, but now we're moving on to day one and day two, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, things are moving so quickly. Uh, I mean, one measure of that is how many talks actually have ChatGPT in them, yeah. right? And if you think about submissions, right? There's actually, I, I looked, uh, very little mention of ChatGPT in, in the entire schedule, right? Yeah. That's how recent this is, right? Like this so is the how- the fastest adoption of a new technology huh. we've right. ever seen, if Correct. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. now I, I bet you next KubeCon in Chicago- it, Gonna be inundated? <laughs> it's yeah. going to be, you know, every talk is going to be on this. So, uh. I think I think you're absolutely right, and I think there's going to be a lot of armchair experts because right. we're we're sitting here in such an early stage. I've had people talking to me about it, and they're like, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm a Chat GPT expert." I'm like, "It's been 90 days, yeah. <laughs> like nobody's an expert in anything in 90 days, really. Yeah. I mean, I guess, yeah, yeah. Do do you think we're we're in? And you touched on the legal side of this, but we're in a real tenuous stage within this. Do you think that Chat GPT and, and the AI ML advancements we're seeing right now are ethical? Do you think they need to be governed? How? I mean, like, uh, from my perspective, you know, we're pushing the boundaries on uh, what's ethical and what's not at this point, and, and I, I'm assuming there's totally a bit of agree. give that has to happen on the legal side, and there's there's probably a, bu a bunch of things that have to be revisited, right? Is it is it open source if I was writing the code and I was assisted by a co-pilot of some sort that brought in proprietary code. Is it still open source? What about the reverse side of this, right? It's a great is question. It, is it proprietary if it actually came from code that was open or, you know, et cetera? And, and so, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that need to be revisited. Or like folks that are putting customer data in open LLM models, right, or, you know. There's some pretty I, wild there's, stuff going on yeah, that is a little and, privacy And again, like, you know, it's, it feels like, it feels like a, the gold rush right now, so people totally are like doing whatever is needed, yep. you know, uh, but <laughs> will they regret later. them? You know, will it stick? It's not clear at this point, it's so early. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it, it's definitely, oh yeah, it's it's vague and it's, and it is dicey. I'm glad you talked about the customer privacy bit. I've been watching people, even some of the videos of the prompts that people are putting in, I'm like, yo, you are exposing <laughs> all your stuff right now on a Twitter thread that you're doing a freaking loom yeah, video. I mean, like, the it's one, like, yeah. The one ahead. that gets me is like, you know, putting private customer data. This is what I mean. Running it through chat GPT so that you can get, you know, uh, a feature. Insights or right. whatever. And you're yeah. literally actually giving away your own customer data, your private data, the thing that actually is a competitive advantage. Right. Yeah. Giving and making part of the public. It's one of the most right. competitive and advantages so, you have. It's exactly. one of the things you can sell all the way to the bitter end or all the way to the top, depending exactly. on what you do. You actually said something earlier to John that I think is really interesting, that proprietary data is the new IP. Tell me about that. I mean, look, if, uh, if you assume that everybody is able to actually build models and it's you know, uh, train models and create and that's going to be a commodity, right? Right. Then the data that trains the models is really the new IP, right? And 
if you look at this number of companies that have private data that is not accessible on the internet in whatever domain, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's financial or infrastructure, automation, etc., right? That data is actually more valuable than the, the result of training a model, right? The actual data is more, more interesting, right? And so, again, going back to, don't, why are you putting your private data in public models? Like, that's, <laughs> well, and, <laughs> and knowingly, you know that, yeah. And knowingly, like, that's to get a feature so somebody can actually give you a prompt, uh, you know, and that's your feature, the prompt, right? Like, yeah. right. I, I, love, I love that you said that, because one of my lines, I'm a, we're all community people here, I mean, this is a celebration of community, but one of my lines is community is your first defensible asset, <laughs> and I love thinking about that as, as the IP within right. that. I mean, yeah. you're, you're just nailing it. Glad we have you on today at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, there must be a reason for that. There must be a reason we keep inviting you back. <laughs> <I> some. must <laughs> be, yeah, there's something. <laughs> Maybe it's just to keep us entertained at 5.15 p.m. on day one, <laughs> which could also be the case. What do you think about ChatGPT? I, I think it's I think it's that and I think that the fact that it could also open you up from a security risk perspective. And I think, you know, I think that that worries me to no end. And you still have to go through and actually review it. You have to be smarter than the code it produces. It's very much. I mean yeah. it kind of reminds like I, I have a, one of those autonomous driving vehicles, right? Yep. Um, and it's cool, right? Like, you know, it what drives over it. The Tesla, yeah, yeah. and it, it's a cool car. It drives for a while. You know, I have to. It asks me to put my hands back on the wheel for every while. Right. Would I put my children in and ask it to drive across country? Absolutely not. Right. right? Uh, what, is it assisting me in driving? That makes sense, right? I maybe we get to the point where it's completely autonomous and drives, but right. we're far away from my my perspective, right? And so, it feels like the same thing with this all this Copilot and ChatGPT stuff. Would I have it? define a security policy for my cloud, and yeah. then walk away and just trust it? Absolutely not. I have to be smarter than it to review what it came up with right. yeah. before I can trust it, right? But it, there is utility in having it help. There's utility in having it assist a human in coming up with stuff. But you still have to be smarter than it because you're, you're liable. You're the one that's actually going to deploy it. So. Just like there's human error, there has to be human oversight. Yeah, yeah. go for it. So that kind of brings the, the future aspect of this into the conversation, like a year from now, we're, you know, we're sitting in Amsterdam again, it's KubeCon again, how many of these vendors have actually integrated feature sets like this and have done the smart thinking around the checking and the fact checking? Everyone. Everyone will have, <laughs> yeah. have done that. And so what's interesting to me is, yes, we're absolutely scratching the surface, but I, I genuinely wonder how far we can go by having the smart people go and build solutions based on this. Well, that's the thing that's interesting. It's kind of like if, if you assume having chat GPT integration, it's kind of like having a website. Yeah. How differentiated is having a website, right? Like, okay, yeah. if you assume that that's the case, then well, how do you differentiate then? If it's actually such a commodity, then how do you differentiate? I think it comes back to private data. Who has the data set that's private that can actually use it to differentiate on models. Well, exactly, and the real winners are going to be those that can use private data sets Correct. in a self-hosted manner, create value out of that, and sell it to customers. Yeah. Like, that's that's going to be the number one thing. So right now, we're experimenting. We're literally just looking at a toy, saying, hey, this is cool, yeah. um, but we're not going to use a toy for anything substantial. And so it's waiting until someone comes up with you know, the self-hosted ideas based on right. chat GPT. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the thing that was super interesting about ChatGTP is the fact that it's really a UX. It's, it's the user experience that made it accessible to other people. It's not like you know, LLMs haven't been around for a while, but I think that's the, the key. And I, I think what will be interesting is, will it help people go through and do troubleshooting or do tracing or things that maybe aren't so proprietary for that, where it's looking for patterns and it goes, well, after this happens, this happens. That, to me, seems like a normal thing that would happen. Or recognizing an abnormality or yeah, something like, yeah. I, I mean, and there are already people in the security space that are doing integrations that are here. And I, I, I think yeah. that's, that's the thing. But where does that data live and is it now public? Or is it learning on those anomalies? That, I think, is the, you know, that'll be interesting. And that there was, I mean, you know, some of the people who are on the floor and the observability, you know, one of the billions out there doing observability, they, they have, they, I was having a chat with them last year and they got angry at me because I was like, you know, I, I don't like the term AI ops. And they're like, why? I go, because 
nobody really has AI. It's, it's not, not taking AI, an yeah. it's not taking an action or something of that nature. It's ML. You have models underneath. I'll give you that. And I, I think that's the interesting thing is where the AI washing of everything next year is going to be, you know, in Paris is going to be just crazy. I'm like, I, it'll be interesting and fun to see, but. We should, uh, we should do a AI bingo next, uh, that, the next Oh week my time. gosh, we should definitely yeah. do a buzzword bingo. I'm so here for that, especially in this space. And I'm curious to see how, how it feels like a lot of people are very all in on what this means, which I think is kind of an interesting, I feel like we've been, you know, there's always some sort of hype curve dragon that we're all chasing. Mm -hmm. But I think in this case, it's because of the functionality that you pointed out. And, yeah. and I actually find the UX a little lackluster in my personal opinion, but that's a more of a design perspective than a, than a utility perspective. But I think, but I think what, what you're pointing out is it, it put the tool in the hands of people to see how we're actually going to use it. Which before, it's really just been big companies secretly building these models and we're not even quite sure what the AI side of it is. Or like yeah. with facial recognition and then it turns out to be racist or it turns into, you know, there's all this stuff that's yeah. happening and I think actually getting this out into the world and letting the open source community mess with it a little bit more is going to, it's going to be our best defense against something nefarious right. happening yeah. in this space is having more hands on deck and a much more diverse group of people interacting with the tool. Yeah, and that's, and that's much better than you know France or Italy forbidding oh, using yeah. this stuff. Like that's not a solution. We have to get our hands dirty, we need to play with it, we need to make mistakes, do, oh, yeah. do stupid things, and then <laughs> you know gradually we'll get to a point where this is actually going to be useful to us. Like to your point, observability, a year from now is going to be completely changed. Yeah, okay. it's going to be completely changed. We're literally scratching the surface. It's such a, such a ninety days in, right? Yeah, ex I mean something like that. Yeah, I mean we're I, and, it, and it's crazy to just think about what a conversation it's become. How many tech bros feel like they're an expert? You know, like a pro when it comes to Chat GPT. And, and then you know we're seeing everything from students doing their homework, leveraging it to you know to, you, to your point, people putting proprietary and private data just straight up in there like it doesn't matter. <laughs> and I mean, it, yeah, it's just uh, it's wild. It's really wild. Okay, guys, last question so we can wrap up the analyst segment. But I'm curious about this. You're a veteran. You guys are obviously going to be around. What are we going to be saying at the next KubeCon? What are we going to be saying in Chicago or in Paris? Any predictions? AI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you mean we're going to be doing this panel again, yeah. but with a little, with, with a yeah. slightly yeah. It'll more... It'll be, uh, you know, 180 card. days in or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll have the bingo cards all set up. Maybe we can... I know, actually yeah. really want to do that. I, I always think, wanted I to think play real buzzword bingo, and should. I feel like we just I, I, should. Yeah, I, I think we're going to be also talking about platform engineering and how there is still continued consolidation and cost reductions happening because I think oh my favorite know, topic platform engineering yes. oh yeah well it's <laughs> I, I think you know when I worked with the devs they said just don't make me an SRE that, that's what they always said is like I, that's the last thing I want to do is get woken up at three in the morning because you know something would bump in the middle of the night but I, I think it's it's going to be an interesting year for yeah. platform engineering let's let's make the SREs go away and let chat yeah. GPT take care of it <laughs> <laughs> yes, on that go. note. There you go. Bassam, Rob, you, thanks for being here. I'm so excited. Thank all of you for tuning in live or in the recorded version of this at home. We are here in beautiful Amsterdam at KubeCon Europe. This is our last segment of day one, but don't worry, we'll be back for day two and day three. I'm Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for high tech coverage.